It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. As always, my name is Brian Wilson, and as always, Andy Grabner's name is Andy Grabner, sometimes Andreas Grabner, but only for his mother. Uh, Happy New Year, Andy. Happy New Year. I just wanted to say it's great that, we, uh, that we're still doing that show, even in 2021, hoping that, well, knowing that 2020 is behind us and uh, yeah. 2021 can only get better, I, I well, think so, right? With a lot of potential. There's a yes. lot of promise on the horizon. So yeah. let's keep our fingers crossed that, uh, yeah, for everybody, and I think this, this good point came up a, a few episodes ago when we were talking about chaos, where when, when talking about chaos testing, if someone says, oh, that'll never happen. Yeah. Again, just got to reference back to 2020. Exactly. Whatever won't happen, COVID, murder wasps, everything, <laughs> you name it. We have a, I think there were some vampires somewhere. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. we are in a new year, new show. It's Yeah, as you mentioned, we've been doing this, I think, since 20... I was going to say 2015, but it, it uh, can be. I think be? 2016. 2016, wow. yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. And thanks to everyone who's been listening if anyone is on here who's listened to the first episode and everyone on who has perfect attendance, thank you so very much. We love you all, and uh, we hope we keep entertaining you with our short banter. You know, really quickly, Andy, I got to mention this. I know we try to keep it short. We used to have it a lot longer in the beginning, right? Um, my wife, we were driving home from my mother-in-law's, and she threw on this podcast, and we're listening, and talk about banter. 15 minutes in, they hadn't gotten to the topic yet. All they were talking about was things like their audio quality, funnily enough, um, and just all this other stuff. I'm like, when does this show start? We're 15 minutes in. So to our guests who are about to introduce, the reason I bring this up and it's relevant is way back in the early days, we used to go quite a bit longer before we went in, not 15 minutes. Now we're pretty good at getting right to the chase. So speaking of getting to the chase, Andy. Perfect. Yeah. I'm very honored to have for the uh, inaugural episode in 2021, for the New Year's episode, uh, Tracy Reagan. And hopefully I pronounced the name correctly because I know there's multiple ways probably how you can spell Reagan it is, Reagan. And I'm sure no got it, wrong. it is. It yeah. is Reagan. And it is quite an honor to be here for the first 2021 podcast. Um, it couldn't be a better way to start the year. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Tracy, um, it's amazing. I have your LinkedIn profile open. And let me just read this out. Creator and CEO of Deploy Hub, helping DevOps teams simplify microservices at scale, CDF board and DevOps Institute ambassador. That sounds like you are really busy. I am really busy. I am really busy, but I've been in a small company for the last 20 plus years. So busy is what you learn. (laughs) Yeah. Now, very cool. And, And we got to know each other. Uh, through the CDF, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. And I actually think, and I remember when we had a chat two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, and I the, the, the invite popped up in my calendar. And then I thought, how did I end up getting a 15-minute coffee call with her? And then I actually remembered and I looked back into my emails and you were basically sending out, was it on Twitter or email or on Slack? If you want to chat with me, just, you know, book a time for a coffee chat and then let's have a conversation, which I thought was really great because this started the whole, you know, the communication or, you know, conversation we now have. Um, and so thank you so much for uh, for being so open and available for the community. Absolutely. It was my goal in 2020 when I realized we were all going to be seeing the world through the Zoom window to really reach out to folks and start talking about uh, what we're facing, not just in terms of being uh, in quarantine or a pandemic, but what we're facing in terms of new technology. Everybody is starting to talk about uh, cloud native and Kates and there is a certainly a tsunami on the way, and there was no better time to do exactly what I did in 2020 and to really start talking to people. And I have probably spoken to, I'd probably say about 500 people over the last year, wow. all in different yeah. levels of their um, journey in, in Kubernetes. Uh, and what better way to really define requirements for an open source project, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was my goal. 
That is really cool. So just as a, uh, let us help you on, help me understand because maybe other people want to follow that same model. You pick a certain time range in a week or like a certain time slot or time slots and you put it on a calendar and people can book the time or? Yep. I block out my calendar um, from nine in the morning until uh, one in the afternoon, my time, mountain time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way I have the afternoons to get work done and I open up the calendar and I, you know, let everybody know. I, you know, reach out to people I see in LinkedIn. If somebody wants to, you know, ex wants to, you know, follow me on LinkedIn, I immediately send them an invite to say, let's not just follow each other. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of someone doing that. That's really, really awesome. I think it's that's the fun. first I've heard of it. Yeah. That's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hey, now, Tracy, I know we both, and I'm sure Brian included, we have uh, one of our favorite topics is kind of thinking and contemplating about what's the future of this discipline that has been around for a while, but it seems it's been stuck a little bit in the in the old way we did things. And I'm talking about continuous delivery, I'm talking about, I think you actually, I mean, this is the first time I even, I mean, I had, I heard the term, you said it's time for a continuous delivery V2. Yes, can absolutely. You, can you enlighten us what that means for you? What what do you what do you want to achieve? Well, you know, if you guys started you, you you started it when you mentioned chaos, right? Earlier in your, in your in your bantering, and we are entering a phase of chaos engineering. Like it or not, we are. Um, when you think about the the real benefit of Kubernetes is the auto scaling and the fault tolerance. And how do you really get that? You get that by decomposing your monolithic applications into functions, microservices. This minute you do that, you create chaos engineering because you instead have one big monolithic that we sorted out all of the, the link issues at the earliest state in the development lifecycle, which is at the compile and link step. And we're leaving that to runtime whether it be in development or QA or, or production, that link step is being done at runtime. That is essence is chaos. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and now while we have solved the problems of sort of encapsulating um, from the, op the operating system, once we've broken apart an application and we don't link it, we are, we are exposing ourselves to uh, problems with different versions of different microservices that make up different versions of the applications across many different clusters. It is a huge chaos problem um, and one I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to think about. We have to really understand what we did when we decided to decompose an application version into independently deployable microservices. What did that mean to the continuous delivery pipeline and how do we now need to morph from the CD perspective, to be able to still have a North Star, still understand what an application version is, and still be able to say, we want to put these new features in version 5.1 of our new application. How do we do that now? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, because I want to test my knowledge. I know Andy's probably got a million questions. I can see it. Now that we can see you, Andy, I can see, I can see your mm -hmm. gears running. But, you know, I do a lot of theoretical, right? I work in pre-sales. I'm not doing implementations. I read about stuff. We talk about stuff. We discuss things with customers. Um, so the one thing that's always tripped me up a little bit has been the idea of service meshes, Istio, for example. And um, the way I described it recently to somebody, thinking I understand it, was similar to what you're talking about, how in traditional applications, you would define your endpoint. You would have a monolith talking to a monolith, and you had a point and it was done. And if you're using something like Kubernetes, you have to define those endpoints in every single pod, every single container running in there. The idea of a service mesh is you just say, you know, connect to login service and Istio or your service mesh knows what those endpoints are login service and manages all that. Only because you're bringing this up, I just wanted to check, am I getting my understanding of service mesh? Is, is that the general concept for that? Yeah, it is. To, just to okay. summarize what service mesh is, it's request routing. Yeah, okay. It's it's pure, but it, I mean, don't even get me started on this conversation. That could be an entire <laughs> different podcast. Exactly, no, no, yeah. we, maybe but, we'll take you up on that one, yeah. But in terms of the, of the, uh, the continuous delivery pipeline in yeah. the future, my prediction is that uh, and when I first started uh, saying this, when we were able to see people in, in person, um, they would look like they would say, you know, I'm crazy or I, they, they thought I'm green or something. I, we, we have the ability to get rid of dev, test and prod because service mesh can do the routing. Now, if we understand we have one big massive cluster. Right. And we put 
all of our app, our microservices are immutable, so they're all running in there. What's the point of having a different cluster? Why can't we just get service mesh to route to the correct persona, the right version of the application? The only the only caveat to that is how do you manage multiple uh, you know dev test and prod databases, which brings me to another really fun conversation, which is mono versus poly databases. <laughs> so yeah, service mesh is really going to that you know most companies haven't started looking at service mesh, but they will. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a, a Spinnaker presentation, and they you know, they did this beautiful presentation. Then they said, now I'm going to tell you we did something and don't think we're crazy because it really solved a lot of problems. He said, we combined our dev and test into one cluster. And I was like, yes, I knew that would happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's beginning. It is beginning. Mm -hmm. And finally, we will get rid of waterfall. We really have always, seen, you know, we talk about waterfall like we've done it forever. Um, but I mean, we talk about agile like we've gotten rid of waterfall, but we still do waterfall. We yeah. still, we, we, in agile, you do a small uh, a change to code. You check it out, you compile the whole beast and you re -re release the whole beast. In microservices, it's the last mile of agile, right? Mm -hmm. And now we can really start thinking about how to get rid of dev test and prod. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all ties into that, CD. Yeah, it's all. I, I think it might be interesting, actually, Andy, to to have some follow up conversations as well, because I think there's a lot of really cool topics we can get into. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I just wanted to check that service mesh thing. If that sounded like a little bit what you're talking about, which it sounds like somewhat. But yeah, let's go back to uh, the idea of CD two. Yeah. Yeah. I but still wanna, yeah. I still want to. I still want to. There's two comments that I have to your statement. First, the first statement is Anita Inkley that she. Uh, head of our DevOps, or we can now call it ACE team. She made a statement about two years ago or three years ago then where she said the maturity of an organization for her is indirect proportional with the number of environments that you have. So that means the more environments you have, the, the less mature you are. If you in the end you only have one environment that is prod, then you obviously reach the highest level of maturity. On the other side, I got to say, and we talked with Kelsey Hightower and others, right? If you think about Kubernetes, there's a lot of things changing in these platforms. And the question is, how do we deal with to, to, to kind of test the new platform versions, the new versions of things we're depending on? Because if everything runs in prod and you are updating your prod cluster to the latest version of Kubernetes without having the ability to test this somewhere, then you may run into the problem that you're upgrading your Kubernetes cluster and all of a sudden everything falls apart. I mean, and maybe I get this wrong. Maybe there's a better option for doing this, but at least this is one of the few reasons I can also think of not trying to achieve prod only. Well, we'll see how the industry goes. Yeah, yeah. We will. Um, and, you know, there is a, uh, a part of that statement that um, you just described, the maturity level based on environments, that has to do with your ability, your team's ability to do true configuration management. Mm -hmm. There should never be a guess about it. Now, certainly, if you're making some kind of big update to a, uh, a cluster or something at the low level, I would say maybe you want to test that in a different cluster, right? Mm -hmm. But for the majority of, for, for you know, it's, it's the old 80-20%, right? 80% um, of the code that we have running in a cluster really doesn't change that often. It's 20%. Yep. So how do we make the 20% as efficient as possible? Yep. And how do, we, how do we support business agility by allowing code to get out to end users as quickly as possible? How do we deliver innovation all the time and that is the essence of a microservice is the ability to do that so while that 20 percent is critical and 20 percent may have to have its own cluster to be tested i do predict that there will be a time in the future that for the majority of the changes they will bounce right to production mm -hmm. yeah no i um uh, your 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 word in in god's ears or whatever <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's at least a saying in, in German. I'm not sure if that translates well into English. Yeah, no, there, there's, there's. I just actually came across that. Uh, I forget what it was on some show. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! It was sorry. It was a. It was some uh, political lassery on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not even going to mention the names. Um, but yes. All right. So let's go back to uh, CD version two now. Uh, Tracy, we have we have talked about. Uh, in, in our coffee call that we had on 
we talked about uh, event-driven continuous delivery. I explained to you what we are doing with Captain, kind of the same story, right? What you are saying, we, we, we were breaking up monolithic applications into services and then connecting them through events, but we haven't done that, let's say, evolutionary step in continuous delivery yet. Is it about time and actually does it solve the problem? And so I would like to get your your thoughts on on what CD version two really looks like, what event driven plays with, and what's what's the event driven concept. I mean, what what is CD version two for you? So if we think about uh, microservices, let's just keep it in the con- the context of a microservice because that is where it really requires the biggest uh, shift in thinking. Not all microservices are equal. We will have microservices that impact lots of applications. We will have microservices that are front end that impacts only one application. We'll have microservices that are security related, login routines, uh, database access routines, and not all of them are equal. Mm -hmm. So why should we continue with a very um, authoritative workflow process that forces every microservice to go through the same workflow. Now, I think one of the, when I first looked at Kepton and I just, you know, this has been some time ago uh, and I read through it, there is a concept of strategy that came up. And I've never, I kept thinking about that. And really what we need is not a CD workflow, but we need CD strategies based on the microservice. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is through something that's more templated, something that's more event driven. And we really should be able to create a workflow on the fly or a strategy on the fly. So if we stop thinking about workflows, because workflows really puts us into this very strict kind of, you know, you do something at dev, you do something at test, you do something at prod. But if you think about a proper strategy for a particular microservice that has a particular risk level, then you start thinking in terms of, well, what do I need to really do to get this out? What is the proper strategy for this particular microservice versus another microservice? which brings us to the idea of, oh, well, if I know the risk level of this particular microservice, we should be able to, on the fly, create a strategy that pushes it through the pipeline that's appropriate for that microservice. Now, whether we do it based on events or some kind of a um, uh, templating engine, I'm a big fan of Stephen Tarana and his uh, Jenkins templating engine. I think that that will save a lot of work for a lot of people who are using Jenkins. Um, I'm, I'm a big f- fan of, of Kepton and how that's, you know, you have a you have a kind of a control plane listener that says these are the events that could be executed. And even Tekton, this is the way, this is the shift in where we're going. Um, Jenkins X just announced their, uh, uh, ver- their beta 3.0 completely based on Tekton and the the events catalog. So now that we have events, we have this idea, how do we best put them to work? And I feel like shifting from this concept of workflows and start thinking about the, the proper strategy for the item that we're managing is where we should be. That is, in my mind, that's the essence of, mm-hmm. of CD version two. Mm-hmm. And so that means, uh, fascinating, and thanks for that. I took a lot of notes. Um, But so it starts then with the assessment of the risk of a microservice. So you need to put them into different buckets and say, hey, this is a, I don't know, very low risk microservice. You can go to production easily. You can do canary deployment. And then we have a certain model of how we turn on the canary load. But then there might be, hey, this is the login service. And if this one fails, then we obviously we have a big problem. So we need to go through a different process or a different strategy. This is um, how do we assess the risk then? How do we automate that or there is, you know, we have something now that we can really start leveraging and it's called machine learning. Mm -hmm. We have all of this information that we should be pulling back um, from uh, the the production environments to start defining risk level. And it has to do with configuration too. If we go back to that discussion around maturity and configuration, um, that's what uh, that's what we are focused on at Deploy Hub. And that's why we're excited. You know, this is sort of an auspicious day for us. This is our first full day for having Ortilius as part of the CD foundation. And Ortilius is a, uh, a microservice management tool that tracks 
microservice, uh, it catalogs them, it tracks their, their deployment metadata, it can track how, um, if it failed when it went out. So, it, it, and based on those, those, those criteria, we're going to start understanding the criteria to start understanding the, the risk level of a microservice. And that is the essence of chaos engineering, right? Because we're going to let the data tell us that, not mm -hmm. a human. We need the data to return that information and we need to act upon it. And, and that acting upon it should start with ass assessing a risk level or the blast radius. What's the blast radius of this microservice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe it should go to a test environment before it goes right to prod, because I, I can promise you in some of those, if we think about a, a, a strategy for a front end where it's just a drop down list that's being changed, that strategy might be let the developers test it and push it out to production right away. But if it's a security routine, we probably would want a strategy that might take it through several different steps of testing before it goes mm -hmm. out the door. So we have to start allowing the um, data drive the CD pipeline. We have to have smart CD pipelines. Mm -hmm. It's not. It shouldn't be something that a human decides that this we're going to, you know, in a very imperative way, say it has to put, be pushed through this kind of a workflow uh, because we're not monolithic anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of the data driving these decisions is really, really important because as you were describing this, my brain initially, it's the first time I'm hearing some of these concepts that you're, you're bringing up here, my brain was already like throwing up barriers like, uh, you know, uh, and trying to think through them. Because I'm like, obviously, I just can't say, you know, that like, let me think about what's making me react this way. And it really came back to, you know, I haven't done, I haven't worked, I've been a sales engineer since 2011. So the last time I did performance uh, uh, testing was you know, 2009, 2010-ish, uh, waterfall, no automated deployments, very immature models, right? And I think that's the key here. Very, very immature models. And we, I remember one time having an argument with the product management team because I wanted to do a performance test on a release. And the developer was like, this is just such a minor thing. doesn't need testing. We're pushing it. It's got to go out. You're not testing it. I'm like, you know, I, I was always like, we should test everything. As, as a good performance tester would be, you know, try to make a fight for it course predictably went to prod and crashed everything right this minor little thing because it was some stupid mistake they made right um and that's what got me thinking like oh how do we how do we say this is a not important or a, a low risk microservice and i think your answer specifically to the data point being let the data drive that not the humans but also i think this all relies on the common thing we've been discussing so far about there having to be a maturity model in place before you're doing these things Right. The reason that one and the reason why I was resisting the idea initially is because we were doing an old fashioned deployment. There was very low maturity. There was, you know, countless times you would deploy from dev to prod to QA. I mean, dev to QA to prod, not dev to prod to QA with, you know, logging turn on full or debug, you know, stupid things like that because that wasn't being treated as code. It wasn't being all these manual switches. So just the, the long point I'm making is if you look at this and if you drop your guard to look at this and not resist, like I started to, um, to think like, okay, if you have a proper maturity model in place and you have your guardrails and you have as many, you know, things automated, like your deployments, probably assuming that's what a lot of what the play hub uh, helps you with, right. Is to automate all these pieces and make sure everything, all the configs are properly set. You remove the, let's say the stupid risk, the stupid human risk from it. And you're, you're left to just using the data you collect to capture the real risk um, from the technical point of view, which can help you do this. So, yeah, no, I, I, I like the idea. In short, I like the idea. I had some reservations as we were going, but I was like, I thought through them. I just wanted to share because I figure a lot of people probably hearing this might be like, oh, come on, come on. But again, you have to be at a certain level. This is not like I know how to drive, so I'm going to get in a, a 747 and, and try to fly it. And remember in your example, um, and by the way, there is such a thing as a prod to test to dev. That's called an emergency release. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there's a lot of those done on a very regular basis. <laughs> but in your example, you're thinking in ter terms of monolithic too. Exactly. That's and monolithic it, yeah. has a bigger, it has, could potentially have a bigger impact um, mm -hmm. because it's monolithic. It's, it, it, you know, when, you, when you're moving smaller functions out, your risk level actually comes down 
uh, for that particular deployment. And that is the whole idea of Agile. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I keep saying. It's, we have really achieved Agile's last mile when we think about microservices. And microservices will be deployed all day long. This is not a, we're going to get into a room and have a meeting about a deployment of a single function. Yeah. And discuss it and then to schedule it and have people stamp it. They have no idea what it does anyway, which used to make me crazy in those kind of deployment kind of <laughs> approval meetings. It's like, you don't know anything about this anyways. Why are you approving it? Trust your developers. And if your developers break it, uh, they need to fix it. And that's the importance of, of configuration management, having a difference report, understanding what you just did and be being able to back it out really quickly or shift from blue to green. We have the skills, we have the tools to be able to make this, this, um, this shift and it's required. It, there isn't, we don't have a way to go back. Microservices has pushed us to a place that we we have to rethink and reimagine everything about our CD pipeline and start making it smart and start making it fast so businesses can really achieve the agility that they've always, you know, driven themselves to achieve. Mm -hmm. They want to be the first one on the market to, to with their new feature, banking, you know, in, insurance, all of these uh, these heavily, um, even the, the securities area, they want those features out today. They don't want to wait. They want to get that stuff out now. We went the, we, I went the vaccine yesterday. <laughs> That's who we are now as consumers. We want it now. Mm -hmm. uh, Tracy, I got a quick question for you then on this. I understand the, the happy world scenario where, where we all have microservices, we all can deploy them independently. And that's where we want to get to, obviously, with different maybe processes, depending on the risk. But in in what I've seen also with organizations that are now moving to microservices and they, they want to push something new out, they always say, well, if we want to, if we want to have this feature, we need to push these five microservices out in this version. Because in the end, they all encapsulate a value stream or like a value increment. For me, the challenge here is now, how do we, do you have any, any thoughts on how you actually organize this and how you are controlling the rollout of services that should be independent, but really they are not because they are depending on individual versions? How do you do this? Is this through feature flags that you just deploy them and then you turn them on at some point or how does this work? Andy, that was, you're very kind to ask that question, to be quite honest. That is the essence of what we're doing with Ortelius. Okay. Think about Artilius as not a deployment solution. Artilius is a configuration management um, solution. So in the Artilius world, let's just break it down to really basic. Um, a microservice is a component. Um, mm -hmm. Applications are a collection of components. And why I use the word component, because it may be something other than a microservice. It could be a Lambda function. I don't really consider that a microservice. Mm -hmm. So it's a collection of components that can be independently deployed. What we have to be able to do is every time a microservice is updated, you know, you, a new, it's registered to Quay, it's in Docker, a new version's in Docker Hub. We have to be able to grab the details about that and version it. Once that's done, we know that anything that, is, that consumes it also has a new version. Now, you brought up another interesting um, idea, which we're talking about for 2021, and that's what I like to call component sets. So while microservices are supposed to be loosely coupled, they're not always loosely coupled. Um, in fact, we know now that people are writing microservices. They're not, they're not an application. They're not the teller application for the bank. They're just a set of microservices that have to be deployed together. That's what we're calling a component set. So what we do is we take that information and we pass that on to tools like Spinnaker or Argo or Helm to actually go off and do the deployment. And we pull back that information and we check that, uh, that deployment file back into our logs so that it's hermetic and can be re re, uh, redeployed at any point in time. But what you end up with is a central database that shows uh, the differences between two releases at a component level or at an application level or at a cluster level. It can show the blast radius of, an, of a microservice even before you deploy it. You can say, I'm a microservice developer. I'm going to update this. How many people are actually consuming it? Oh, wow, 15 applications are using this. Maybe I should be a little more careful and notify everybody that is coming across. 
Or maybe our CD pipeline should be smart enough to say this microservice has been updated. Go look at the configuration data and then re-execute the workflows mm -hmm. for all of the testing for all of those applications before it goes out the door. So everybody's had an opportunity to look at it. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that, that statement that you read about the maturity level. It has to do with being able to understand how applications are put together, what their differences are as they get pushed across, and the versions that consume them, and what their blast radius is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it becomes, it's back to being able to see the puzzle, the top of the box of the puzzle. What are you building? <laughs> what, what does this puzzle really look like? Even though yeah. it's logical, we are still building applications, and we yeah. still have to be able to see it that way. And that's and that's 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 what the Ortelius open source uh, community. That's the problem set that we're solving. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, when I when I asked the question, I had no idea that you were actually releasing Utilius today. So this is not that I do you a favor here. Not, not a setup, really. <laughs> um, but 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 basically, to the listeners now, we we tell them that we've recorded this not in the new year, but maybe in the old year. If to look up the release date, so damn it. Ah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, they they already probably forgot what we were yeah. talking about in the beginning. So, you know, the, go on, Andy. Now, this is interesting. So we have the, you know, as you know, with what we do with Captain, um, we obviously have a very tight integration with monitoring tools, whether it's Prometheus or obviously also Dynatrace. That's where most of us work. And we have all a lot of this data, right? Dependency data. We know we have version information. And that was also our thinking, like, what, what can we do this data? Or which other tools can leverage the data that we have by doing distributed tracing across your microservices and knowing exactly how many users are currently using a particular service that is like three levels down and what's the blast radius if this falls. Also, how often has this component failed in the last month when it was talking to another service in a certain version range, right? We have all this data. So I think we should also, besides this podcast, uh, try to figure out how we can get our data to your tooling. And it's that kind of combined data that's going to start giving us those risk assessments. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we then can push back into that CD version two, right? Mm -hmm. To just define the strategy for any particular mic microservice based on a, the data that says this is the risk of it. Yeah. And that's that also would another, be cool. Yeah, it would be cool. <laughs> so and, there's cool. An, and, and there's another component that I just learned about last week because I was invited to a hackathon that we had internally. And one of the guys, he was creating uh, a tool. He analyzed our... So in Dynatrace, we detect problems and also root causes right, when we detect a problem. Yeah? And he was basically looking at uh, the problem history of the last month. And he figured out, are there any particular points during the day where, where more problems occur than other times during the day and to what are they related to is it infrastructure problems because let's say every day at two o'clock in the afternoon some team is doing infrastructure updates i don't know right and then he was looking at it on a daily basis on an hourly basis on a weekly basis and it's very interesting to also then put this into consideration because if you know that there's an 80 percent chance if you want to deploy now that it fails based on historical data, not because of that service, but maybe because something else you don't have under control, then you can say, you know what, let's move this deployment window a little further out. Exactly. So and, if and this is the point in time that we're, it's auto-scaling, maybe you don't want to deploy it at that point in time. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of cool data that we can then use to influence our automated deployment decisions. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think this is the the big area of... I don't want to say needs improvement. I think the ideas are there, but the area that needs implementation. And we, we, we talk about this with a lot of our guests who have awesome tools, right? About data sharing and getting data from one tool to another, because there's a lot of tools out there now that can leverage each other's data. And I think there really needs to be a focus on integrating these tools. It's part they all have the APIs, they all have the ingest, they can all process and use them. Um, and there's a ton of potential ton of potential floating out there to get to those even you know deeper maturity models and i think that's the biggest challenge facing everyone is actually getting the time and the ability to to get those set up because just think about when we can get all these things hooked up right it's really really cool conceptually i just I mean, 
Yeah. And I mean, it's just the, the struggle end, of time, right? Exactly. I mean, I think in the end, every tool vendor wants to get as much data as possible because the more data you have, obviously, the more magic yeah. you can do with it. <laughs> but still, I think every every tool vendor has their speciality field where their AI, their ML, whatever it is, their algorithms, just, you know, based on their historical based on their history they, they can just do certain things like tracy you can do probably great things in your tools with the information about deployments and metadata on these deployments we can do a lot of great things on the data trace side with uh, distributed traces and root cause analysis of problems so but you're right i mean in the end we need to figure out a better way to to integrate these data streams to give the right data to the right tools so that these tools can then make the right decision at the right moment in time yeah, yeah, there needs to be a there needs to be a data stream framework. Okay. <laughs> right. There you go. There's, a, there's your next open source project. You know, yeah. the the other comment I wanted to make on this is that um, I love all these ideas, but when I when I interact with customers in the real world, at least the areas that I'm focusing on, we know that there are no quote unquote unicorns, right? Um, what used to be the unicorn is just someone getting there first and people following. But I do find that there are a lot of people who, you know, there are, there are a lot of companies who then, let, let's say the unicorn turns into a horse and a lot of people start getting horses. I think there are a lot of companies and organizations out there who buy a large dog and put a saddle on it and call it a horse, right? And I think that's the biggest challenge because what I run into quite often is a company who, where their heart's in the right spot, but they half-ass it. Right? Because maybe that's all the resources they have. They maybe they have a hard time getting enough talent in there that can actually execute, whatever reasons. Right? They get some of it done, and then everything. When you try to get it to that next level, it all starts to fall apart because they have a, a really shaky foundation or not a good foundation at all. And to me, that's like how do this is I, I guess going more on a philosophical level. How do we overcome that? Because there's a lot of great ideas. There's a lot of really awesome things people can do when they have that maturity model. But I think a lot of people start their journey with a really shaky foundation. And then from there, everything gets exponentially harder to build up. It's so how do you go right? back and... Yeah, it's cultural. Yeah. These, are, these are cultural problems. You know, I, I, I'm part of the DevOps Institute. And Jane Grohl always talks about the, uh, you know, the people of DevOps. And there, there is a cultural shift that we're, we're facing. Um, and one of them, one of the bigger, I think, cultural shifts is upper management allowing teams to fail. Failure has always been such an, has, has always had negative, you know, connotations to it. But really, if you fail, you've learned how not to do something. <laughs> and failing and failing fast um, is the best way to, to, to move from a horse, from a dog to a horse. Because I think a lot of times we only want to, we're, we're, there is some, we're timid and we don't want to completely buy into a process. And so we only just try certain aspects of it. And that's what keeps that uh, saddle on a, on a dog. So when having an upper management who says, yes, we're going to have your back when you fail, I'm a director and I'm going to make sure that you're protected because you tried something new, you tried something innovative, and the next time we're going to get it right and it's going to make our lives easier, maybe in two months from now, not today. That is the cultural shift that has to happen. Upper management has to have the, the backs of their of, of people who are trying new technologies because you're right. You can't have, you know, you, you don't want to put a saddle on a dog. I just made that up. I don't know if that's a real I, thing. It, but I, I don't it. know Can either, you... but it works. It works really well. <laughs> but, but how do you get that upper management? I'm sure you, you've run into this all the time as well with, with, with uh, places you're going to. How do you get that upper management to, to, to buy in? Right. And I don't mean dollars with products. I just mean like to say, yes, we are going to finally commit to this. Cause that I think is always the hardest part. I mean, a lot of times we talk to the people on the ground doing this stuff and they get it, right? But it's just yeah. the, the limitation. So how do you break through that barrier? How do you get people to take a vaccination? True. It's, it's, I think there's a, it, it, there's, it's not ignorance. It's being ill-informed. Yeah. Or and scared I to think, take the risk. Or scared, scared to take the risk because you're ill-informed if you have the information. True. Which is why we need to start leveraging all of the data that we have, because there's nothing that uh, upper management loves more than reports, right? 
-hmm. If we can show them from reports that we can achieve greater things with newer technology, if we inform them, uh, you know, if somebody saying no is just a request for more information. Interesting. So how do we constantly provide upper management the information that they need so they can make the right decision. Now, they may be, may be super risk averse and they're never going to want to move to a, 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 a microservice environment. But guess what? The developers will do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. They might need another cluster. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they'll have their own cluster and they'll be have, running all this really cool stuff. And then uh, one of the directors will say, we need to get this to production and then it's born. So yeah. it's we have to inform them. We have to understand that they're busy with their day-to-day -day work and they're not down in the weeds. So how do we inform them? Great. Yeah. It's a challenge. Hey, so kind of trying to wrap this thing up here and I actually wonder, right? Initially, I thought uh, the title of this episode is going to be CDV2. Now, looking back at my notes, yes, we talked about, obviously, it continues to live, but we talked about a much broader topic or the problem we really want to solve is basically uh, smart. I mean, I think you actually called it earlier somehow, like smarter, smarter delivery strategies for modern microservice architectures or something like that. Tracy, I want to actually give it back to you. What would you call this episode what would be what was the the main the main topic well we have covered think? many topics but yeah. i do think that we are talking about how to make this continuous delivery smarter how do we leverage data how do we bring all of this information together to stop the human factor of deciding a workflow and instead using the data to create a strategy mm -hmm. You could also, I mean, I, I just, you know, because we had some political things earlier, you could say, how to make continuous delivery great again. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. But it's funny. It's yeah, it is, funny. because you said, how to make continuous delivery smarter. And I said, how to? Oh, yeah, okay. No, I, I, don't think, I don't think we got into it as deep as we wanted to. But in, in summary, though, that's the, that's the, the crux of cd2.0 that you're saying right is the idea of it being the strategy per microservice as opposed to a workflow as opposed right? to, yes a predefined mm -hmm. um imperative kind of workflow. everything goes through this flow it's we can't do that anymore yeah you can't and it's can't and that. in the end it's it is it is smart automated decisions based on data so it's data driven decisions and uh, what we've been trying to do with Captain is where we try to put SLIs and SLOs at the center of everything we do. So every time we execute an action, we validate it against the data. But I think we talked about this much now in a, in a much broader sense of also using data up front to really put a marker, a tag on a service and say, you are risk level two, you go here. You're risk, risk level five, you go here. Exactly. Before uh, it ever goes out the door, ca gathering exactly. that information so that we could mm -hmm. do some smart uh, smart processing on it. We, we need to be able to apply that ML to that data. And between the monitoring data and the configuration data, we have a majority of it. We really mm -hmm. do. We have quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And to borrow on Andy's political thing to uh, maybe go back before Andy's awareness of US politics, we'll go back maybe 15 to 20 years ago and say we'll do some uh, data-driven strategery. <laughs> data-driven strategery. <laughs> if for anybody who remembers the strategery one. I do, <laughs> but I don't I honestly don't recognize U.S. politics today. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hey, Tracy, uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, projects today, uh, Utilius and others. Any? So Artilius, or what was the name of it? Abraham Artilius was the first map maker. And I often uh. remind people that not only was he the first, he, he created the first Atlas, World Atlas. And how did he do that? He went around to all these cartographers and said, please give me your material. And he assembled one big map. He was the first open source community. Wow. Literally. I would have thought his last name would have been Map. <laughs> it's Abraham Ortilius. And so we figured it was a really befitting name it is. because we're, we're basically mapping a, a Death Star. If you think about a cluster and all the points of light, we are creating, you know, we're mapping that. And we're mapping that before it ever goes out to that cluster. We're, we're saying, if you do this, this is what your cluster is going to look like today. Mm -hmm. Sounds like our Smartscape. We also map everything in our Smartscape, but it's for another discussion. Cool. <laughs> uh, we will definitely make sure, Tracy, to get the links 
out there to the folks. Is there any, you know, knowing that this airs in 2021, early 2021, are there any, any big events that are coming up that people should be aware of in, let's say, the first quarter of 2021? Um, well, in April, I am leading a uh, track for the DevOps Online Summit, which is really cool. We, he does it through um, Slack. Uh, so certainly, if anybody out there is listening and they would like to do, submit a talk uh, on any of these topics, uh, I would love to have uh, their their feedback. Um, Tracy at deployhub.com is where you can reach me. So if you want to speak uh, in a, on a Slack-driven DevOps uh, show, it's quite fun. I did it last year. Uh, there's a lot of discussion because what he does is he just runs the um, episode in Slack, and then everybody's talking about it afterwards. Uh, I think it's a really great platform for doing that. Um, please reach out. And also make sure that if you have a chance, uh, sign up for one of your coffee chats. That was yes, really yes, yeah. greatest. That's really good. Just send me an email, and I'll send you my calendar link, and we can, yeah. uh, you know, chat away. Because I learned a lot. I have learned so much from everybody, and I really have to thank everybody who's taken me up on those coffee chats in 2020 mm-hmm. because I have been able to really pull together a pretty clean roadmap for the Artilius project. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, hopefully we can um, get you back on. I know there are a couple of topics we touched upon early on. Um, maybe we can get you back to to just dive into those more. And if there's anything more, if we want to go in deeper on CD 2.0, more of uh, anything there, I think it'd be great to have you back on. This was this was great. Service um, mesh. Yes, yeah, service mesh. All that. Yeah, yeah. I think there's. I, I can if I can see you becoming a very uh, recurring guest, but we'll try to read that. I know you have other work to do as well. Still a little bit, right? Uh, Just a little. <laughs> but, well, thank uh, you. Thank you so much, both wonderful. of you. This has been a pleasure. Awesome. Andy, any last final words or shall I wrap it up? Just uh, let's make sure that 2021 is going to be an awesome year and we have it all in our hands and wear a mask. Yeah. Amen to that. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you have any questions or comments for Andy or I, you can reach us at pure underscore DT on Twitter, or you can send us an old-fashioned email at pureperformance at dynatrace.com. And we will have all of Tracy's links in the show notes, so please make sure to check those out. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.